Anna Strasser and I'm a philosopher from Berlin. Thanks for watching this video in which I will discuss whether joint commitments can live longer than individual commitments. There are plenty of controversial questions once we start to discuss joint actions. In my talk, I want to concentrate on questions concerning joint commitments. I will start with some general considerations about various kinds of commitments. Then I will introduce the clashing intuitions Gilbert and Brabham seem to have. And in the last step, I will report from an experimental approach to investigate intuitions of naive participants. Finally, I will explain my own armchair intuitions. Let's get started with a rough sketch of the varieties of commitments. Analyzing individual actions, we can observe that agents stand in a specific relation to their intentions. This relation can be described as an individual commitment. Being commitment to your intention helps you to plan individual actions unfolding over longer timescales and enables you to resist temptations and distractions. And if others know about your commitments, it is easier for them to predict your behavior. Turning to joint actions, one may assume something like a group's relation to their shared intention. Such joint commitments are helpful for planning and coordinating joint actions unfolding over longer timescales as well. Furthermore, they can facilitate cooperations by making people willing to perform actions they would not perform otherwise. Besides the standard notion of joint commitment, one can also describe a minimal sense of commitment, as John Michael and colleagues have done. In short, one can assume that expectation and motivations can be disassociated, resulting in cases in which eventually just one agent stands implicitly in a commitment relation to the shared intention of the joint action. In general, commitment can be understood as a social glue for much of what counts as social interactions. It provides the securities humans need to rely on each other. Asking um, whether joint commitments can live longer than individual commitments, I have to explore to what extent individual commitments and joint commitments and joint actions can fall apart. If I would assume that they can fall apart, I would argue for a non-normative position regarding joint actions. That means I would claim that the joint commitments do not constitute a necessary condition for joint actions. However, if I would favor a normative approach, I would describe cases of joint actions where a joint commitment even exists in cases where one of the participants does not entertain a matching individual commitment anymore. Then I would argue that all joint actions are necessarily based on joint commitments. As a third possibility, one could opt for a maybe and add that besides full-fledged commitments, there are also minimal senses of commitment. Then one can at least claim that one has not yet found any joint actions without um, at least a minimal sense of commitment. So it's all about whether participants of a joint action can change their individual intuition without destroying the joint commitment. In the philosophical debate, clashing intuitions meet here. Paradigmatically, one can take Bradman and Gilbert as representatives of the contradictory positions, who both, by the way, received the in 2019, the Lebowitz Prize of the American Philosophical Association. Bradman stands for the non pronormatives claiming that changing an individual intention necessarily destroys the joint intention and assuming that there are minimal joint actions without joint commitments. Whereas Gilbert, Gilbert argues that the joint commitment remains because it is a necessary condition for all joint actions. Let's dive into the debate. On this slide, I transformed the well-known vignette Hiking Up the Hill by Margaret Gilbert into a comic. The first picture shows that there is an explicit joint commitment of Ned and Olive, namely hiking up to the, hill, uh, hiking up to the top of the hill. 
A bit later, Ned changes his mind and decides that he will only go halfway, but he does not inform Olive. Later on, both meet Pam, and Pam asks Olive how far they plan to go. In the last picture, Olive speaks on behalf of the group and says that they intend to hike to the top of the hill. Gilbert claims that Olive made an accurate statement. Whereas Bradman doubts whether there is still a shared intention, respectively a, shared, uh, a joint commitment by saying, as I see it, once Ned has changed his mind, they no longer have a shared intention to climb to the top. So the question is whether Olive is justified to claim a joint commitment. Considering Olive's epistemic standpoint, I would argue that Olive did not make a false statement because she did not know that Ned has changed his mind. In the beginning, the initial joint commitment was accompanied by common knowledge. In the next picture, the common knowledge condition does not hold anymore because Ned didn't inform Olive that he decided to go only halfway. Pam assumes that Olive and Ned are acting together. Therefore, I think according to Olive's knowledge, the joint commitment holds. Returning to Bradman and Gilbert, how can we explain their contradicting intuitions? Both seem to agree that there is a joint action at the moment when Pam asks Olive. Explaining Bradman's intuition, I can only guess that he might think that because of that change of mind, because of the change of mind of Ned was not accompanied by an update of the common knowledge condition, the original joint action changed its character and is now only a minimal joint action without the original joint commitment. That could be why he concludes that joint actions are not necessarily normative. On the other hand, Gilbert seems to assume that a missing common knowledge condition does not destroy the joint commitment. From her perspective, the common knowledge condition does not have to be maintained throughout the joint action. Consequently, she assumes that joint actions never lack a joint commitment and concludes that joint actions are always necessarily normative. Both positions are based on certain philosophical intuitions. Instead of further guessing what background assumption might have triggered their intuitions, I will now turn to a different strategy and investigate to what extent one or the other intuition corresponds to common sense intuitions. However, there is no guarantee that common sense intuitions are also to be preferred on philosophical grounds later on. What I will do in the following is discussing experimental investigation testing intuitions by systematically sampling naive participants' intuitions about experimentally controlled scenarios. To this end, I have chosen two studies dealing with hypotheses that can be generated by the normativist approach by Margaret Gilbert. So, the empirical result of the study by Javier gomez Lavin and Matthew Raja, I hope I pronounced them the right way, support a normative approach. In contrast, a recent study by Steve Butterfield and John Michael could not confirm Gilbert-based hypothesis. Assuming that the first study did not coincidentally involve only Gilbertarians and the other study only um, involved more Bradman, Bradmanians people. A critical comparison of the two studies may shed some light on why intuitions sometimes are more likely to point in one direction and sometimes are more likely to point in another direction. To introduce the studies, Gomez, Lavin and Raja conducted six experiments to explore whether the interviewed participants saw an intuitive connection between a joint action and normativity. To this end, they used a three times one between subject design, comparing answers of three conditions, namely a control condition in which no joint action was present, a low and a high condition presenting more or less obvious joint actions. 
First, they examined a helping scenario to investigate whether participants assume that a spontaneous helper has an obligation to notify the helped when he or she leaves the joint action. In addition, they also inquired whether the actor being helped would have the standing to rebuke the helper for leaving the joint action. To rule out that the specificities of the helping scenario trigger the queried judgments, they examined other scenarios of joint actions in further experiments. Here, both perspectives were also distinguished. And the, um, the perspective of the um, participant who does not change her intention and the perspective of the participant who changes their intention with respect to the joint goal. Finally, it was also examined whether participants understand scenarios in which a mutual obligation exists as joint actions and whether they believe that the attribution of an obligation would also create a moral obligation. To sum up, their results did support the hypothesis they had, namely that joint actions are inherently normative and that this normativity is distinct from morality. Turning to Butterfield and Michael, um, which have also generated experimentally testable hypotheses from Gilbert's position, their experiment used as well a 3 times 1 between subject design to compare results of intention, commitment and obligation merits in three conditions, namely a baseline condition in which an unambiguous joint action was presented, a test condition in which one participant of the joint action secretly changed his individual intentions, and a parallel condition in which no joint action was present. Referring to Gilbert, they expected that the median of the test condition should be equal to the median of the baseline condition, and that the median of the test condition should be different from the median of the parallel condition. Additionally, checking whether answers of one measure could predict answers of, of the other measures, they assumed that Gilbert would expect that the responses of each measure will predict the answers of the other measures, because, according to her positions, Every joint action necessarily goes along with shared intention, commitment and obligations. However, it turned out that the results could not support those hypotheses. The median of the baseline and the test condition were not equal. And the median of the test condition was not significantly different from the parallel condition. And also, the patterns of predictions did not support the, the hypothesis, as you can see on the slides in detail. So, maybe we shouldn't compare those studies. But I think there are reasons why we can compare those studies. I have to admit that these different results did astonish me quite a bit. We are used to the fact that philosophical intuitions contradict. But one might have thought that at least common sense assessments would at least point in a similar direction. Why could the study of Gomez, Laveur and Raja provide evidence for intuitions supporting a normative approach that um, Butterfield and Michael could not find? To start, I explore on which basis we may compare those two studies. Both are aiming to check hypotheses generated by a normative approach, and both are taking using a 3 times 1 between subject design. So, if we assume that the baseline condition in study 2 maps to the high condition in study 1, and the test condition illustrating a joint where one participant has secretly changed his individual intention maps to the low condition of the other study and the parallel condition corresponds to the control condition, one might assume that when one can compare the two studies. Furthermore, I assume that the walking scenario is probably best to, compare, to be compared with the hiking scenario of the other study. Therefore, I will compare now the relationships between the conditions by means of the rebuke measure in experiment 3 of the first study and the commitment measure in experiment 1 of the second study. So this is just a screenshot of how both presented their result. 
Now you see on the left side the results regarding the rebuke measure of the experiment 3 of the study of Gomez, Lavin and Raja. On the right side you see the results of the commitment measure of experiment 1 in the study of Butterfield and Michael. As you maybe have remarked, I flipped the picture so that the um, order of the condition is the same. If we compare the relationship between the conditions, one can highlight a disagreement concerning the relationships of the test and low condition. So, the relationship between low and high in study 1 is not similar to the relationship between test and baseline, because study 1 did not find differences between low and high, whereas in study 2 there are differences between test and baseline. Second, the relationship between low and control in study 1 is not similar to the relationship between test and parallel because study 1 did find differences between low and control whereas um, there are no differences found between test and parallel in study 2. However, at least both studies agree on stating that the relationship between baseline and high involves a significant difference in the same direction than parallel control. So what can we make out of this? As far as I interpret this pattern of results, I would assume that the participants in study 1 took the scenario describing the two kinds of joint actions low and high is somehow similar and judged that the scenario describing low can be clearly distinguished from the scenario describing the non-joint action condition called control. In contrast, the participants of the other study did not see a similarity between the scenarios describing the two kinds of joint actions, test and baseline, and rather judged that there is a similarity between the scenario describing the non-joint action case, parallel, and the scenario describing the joint action condition test. Of course, I do not know what participants actually thought, but it looks like as if the first study made it easier to recognize actions in low as joint actions, whereas in study 2, Participants maybe had some difficulties taking the actions in the test condition as joint actions. Probably it would have been worthwhile to include manipulation checks and define a cutoff to exclude people who did not understand the scenarios in the way it was um, intended regarding study 2. But this is not the only problem. I think that there are further problems be generated by the way the questions are framed. Maybe they did not measure the same thing. Leaving aside the manipulation checks used in study 1, I investigate what the measures did measure, or at least I'm trying to investigate this. So looking at the first study, um, the notification measure, asking whether the person who peels off should notify the other that is leaving, I think this is pointing to a normative relation one could describe as a commitment of this person. On the other hand, the rebuke measure, which is used in experiment 3, which is questioning whether the person who stays has the right to call out the person who peels off, points to a normative relation one could describe as a commitment of this person. Um, because she is expecting that the other one is committed. What well, is obvious that such measures always ask questions just about one agent. Turning to the measure of Michael, Butterfield and Michael, the obligation, um, the, the, the commitment question, um, which um, is to what extent do you think that Ned and Olive have a commitment to walk at the top of the hill? points to a normative relation one could describe as a bidirectional standard joint commitment. This measure is asking a question about both agents. Concluding, I say, surprisingly, the first study seems to examine the presence of a minimal sense of commitment, while the second study looks for a fully, full-fledged, developed um, joint commitment. And I say surprisingly, because it was John Michael and colleagues who introduced the notion of a minimal sense of commitment. What can we do now?
maybe. Gomez Lava and Raja made it too easy. And maybe Butterfield Michael made it too hard. Finding indicators for a minimal sense of commitment makes it more likely to take a scenario as describing a joint action. Not finding indicators for full-fledged commitment, you might think that the scenario doesn't describe a joint action. While waiting for further results, assessing common sense intuitions, I return to my armchair intuitions about Ned and Olive. In favor of Gilbert, I claim that even minimal joint actions display a minimal sense of commitment. They are not free of commitments. Arguing for this claim, I emphasize Pam's perspective, which shows that there is a commitment in the sense that she expects that Ned should feel committed and that he, she, herself feels, of course, committed. Furthermore, I assume that Ned has a bad conscience for not informing Olive. Consequently, there is a commitment in the sense that Ned thinks that Olive expects him to be committed. This is why I would answer the question, can joint commitments live longer than individual commitments positively by saying that a minimal sense of joint commitment can live longer than respective individual commitments. To conclude, I try to draw a picture explaining my armchair intuitions and look forward to discuss this in the following Q&A session. Thanks a lot for listening and I'm looking forward for, to the discussion.